if you have Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1. Um, you've heard me say it before when it comes to biblical prophecy. Jesus fulfilled 300 prophecies concerning his first coming. So Old Testament prophecies, 300 of them. And one person fulfilling just eight prophecies uh, some mathematician at USC many years ago came up with this formula, and he said one guy fulfilling eight prophecies is equivalent to filling the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. And you take one silver dollar, put a red X on it, and you bury it somewhere in the state of Texas. And you blindfold somebody, you fly them over Texas, and they got one chance to reach down blindfolded anywhere in Texas and pull out that silver dollar with the red X on it. That's the chance of one person fulfilling eight biblical prophecies. He fulfilled 300. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But at the time of Jesus' birth, the Jewish people were very anxiously waiting for their promised Messiah, their deliverer. Moses had prophesied that God would send the prophet who would be greater than Moses. Uh, here's a verse to check out, Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. It says, uh, this is Moses saying of Jesus, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. So how do we know that Moses is referring to Jesus here? Because nearly 1,400 years later, on the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter quotes this verse, and he refers this to Jesus. He is the one that would be raised up like Moses. He is a prophet, and you shall hear him. So Matthew was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things down so that the Jews would see that this person named Jesus of Nazareth came through the lineage of both Adam, or not Adam, Abraham, and David, very two important figures, obviously, to the Jewish people. And Jesus is going to be proven to be the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world. So we're going to quickly go through uh, chapter 1 of Matthew, looking at the genealogy. It says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So right at the very beginning of this book, Matthew links Jesus with Abraham and with King David. Abraham was the one God promised that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you... All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Jesus is a fulfillment of how all the world can be blessed, would be blessed. When a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ and they get saved, uh, they, they turn to the Lord, He saves them, washes their sins away. Obviously, they're going to be blessed for eternity. That's the power of why Jesus Christ came. That's the fulfillment of what God promised to Abraham. As for King David, God promised him that someone would sit upon his throne forever. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, uh, God sent the, the prophet Nathan to David, and this is what he says, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. The Jewish people understood that this was referring to their Messiah. He's the only one that could fulfill that, where the throne of God would be established forever through David. And again, this is what Matthew sets out to prove here. Jesus is a fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and his promise to David. You know, for us, we look at genealogies, we don't get that impressed with them. We usually get bogged down by them. You read through the book of Chronicles, and it's like, oh my goodness. It's just one name after another name. It means nothing to us. But to the Jews, it was very important. They had to know. That was one of the ways they proved that you came through this lineage, and Jesus Christ had to come through the line of David. Now, this genealogy we'll look at quickly here uh, proves the royal line of King David. And it's through 
David through Solomon, and then we'll see that it goes all the way to Joseph, but he's not the biological father of Jesus Christ. Now, there's another genealogy in Luke's gospel, but his bloodline as the son of man goes through Adam, and it comes all the way down through David, through a different son, Nathan, to Heli, who is the father of Mary. And that fulfills the prophecy that we're going to look at. This is why it's such an important genealogy. As you go through these lists of names of these men and women listed here for us, the, the intriguing thing to me is that Jesus did not have a genealogy that you would be very excited about. If you had a lineage like this, you'd probably be like, yeah, I don't want people to know about this person or that person. I know a lot of you have looked into your family history through, you know, Ancestry.com and others. Our daughter Christine has done a lot of that, and she's traced my grandfather on my mom's side back to the 1300s in Norway. Uh, we know that um, they were on the Norwegian-Swedish border, and in the 18, uh, late 1800s, half of that region where my grandparents, my great-grandparents were, uh, half of the people in that region died because of famine. That's how they came to America you know, because of that famine. So it's interesting to look at those type of things and just get a picture of what happened in the past. It's kind of fun. It's kind of exciting. Elizabeth's family on her dad's side, you can trace it back to Stephen Hopkins, who was on the Mayflower. He was one of the guys that, uh, he, he basically the architect of the Mayflower Compact, which was the precursor to the U.S. Constitution. So genealogies, they can be fun, they can be interesting, but here with Jesus' genealogy, we see a list of people who are all over the place, a list of people that were liars, deceivers, adulterers, prostitutes, Gentiles, murderers, four women with questionable backgrounds, a king who was cursed by God, and we'll see why that is important to the narrative here. So basically, there's a lot of shady characters. What this should tell us is God is merciful. He is gracious, and he is full of forgiveness. He loves us. So his only begotten son, Jesus, was and is not ashamed to be identified with any of us. So quickly, look at verse 2. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Remember, Tamar was a widow. She dressed up like a prostitute. Judah goes into her, and they have twins. And so Tamar is in the lineage here. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab. Remember Rahab the harlot? She's the one that uh, hid the spies when uh, the Jews were getting ready to come into the promised land. Uh, Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. That's based on the book of Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. So again, a lot of family drama here in this list. Um, Ruth was a, a Moabite woman. She wasn't even a Jew, but she marries Boaz. And um, anyway, Jesse begot David the king. David begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Who was that? Bathsheba. Remember, he, had a, he committed adultery with Bathsheba and then has Uriah, her husband, put to death. So David, a murderer, an adulterer in the lineage of the Messiah. Then it says in verse 7, Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah. Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram. Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. So here some of the kings are mentioned after Solomon. Uh, these various kings of Judah, because the kingdom split after Solomon died. And some of these are good kings. There's eight good kings mentioned in the Old Testament, and you know, the kings over Judah. And some of these listed here are good kings, but then it says Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Ammon. Manasseh was one of the worst kings in the history of Israel or in Judah. 
For 55 years he reigned and he brought in sacrifices of babies. He sacrificed some of his own children. He was brutal. He was, you know, sacrificing to the pagan god Molech. So, look at verse uh, uh, 10 again. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Ammon. Ammon begot Josiah. He was the last of the good kings. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Now, this is interesting here because Jeconiah was so wicked, God pronounced a curse on him that he would have no one in his lineage that would become a king in Judah. Uh-oh, we have a problem. This is what we read in Jeremiah 22, verse 30. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, speaking of Jeconiah. A man who shall not prosper in his days, none of his descendants shall prosper, sitting on the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. So again, the problem is this King Jeconiah, who is a descendant of David, has a curse placed on him by God. None of his descendants, it says here, will sit upon the throne of David. But again, didn't God say a son of David would sit upon his throne forever? Yes, God did say that. So how could Jesus be the fulfillment of God's promise to David? Well, there's a couple of important points to take note of here. If Jesus was the actual son of Joseph, he would be under the curse. But he's not the physical descendant of Joseph. He, Joseph is his stepdad. I'm sure Satan was counting on the fact that he was going to have this lineage cursed, and so that would break God's promise that he would send a deliverer, he would send one who would sit upon the throne of David forever. But what he failed to take into account is that God used a different son of David to fulfill his promise. It wasn't through Jeconiah, but God has another son, you know, besides Solomon, he has Nathan. Nathan was one of David's son, and it's through the lineage of Nathan that we see David, you know, God preserved David's seed. Who came through the seed of Nathan? Heli, the father of Mary. And that is how this comes to play. The problem of Jeconiah's curse was bypassed through the virgin birth, the miraculous conception of Mary by the Holy Spirit of God. And so Jesus becomes the legal heir to David's throne through Joseph, but he becomes the biological son of David through Mary. And so this is how God fulfills his amazing covenant with David. This is also why Jesus Christ is called the King of kings and the Lord of lords throughout the scriptures. It's through the virgin birth that God would fulfill his promise to King David that one would sit upon his throne forever. This starts way back. Here's another prophecy, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is in the garden after Adam and Eve have sinned. And the Lord appears, and he curses the serpent. And this is what he says, I will put enmity between you, speaking of Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. The seed there is capitalized, speaking of Jesus. He, Jesus, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So that's the first hint of the, human, uh, of the virgin uh, miraculous conception. Uh, the, the birth from a virgin in the Bible, because the seed comes from the man, not the woman, but Mary would miraculously conceive, as we'll see here, and bring forth Jesus. And so it was the, uh, the virgin birth that kept Jesus sinless. It's the virgin birth that kept him free from Jeconiah's curse. So look at verse 12 here in Matthew 1. And after they were brought to Babylon... Jeconiah begot Sheatiel, so now here's the, after the Babylonian captivity, then you get these guys mentioned. Sheatiel begot Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begot Abiud, Abiud begot Eliakim, Eliakim begot Azor, Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliad, Eliad begot Eliezer, Eliezer begot Mathen, and Mathen begot Jacob, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And so 
It's made very clear here that Jesus was not the biological son of Joseph. Otherwise, he'd be under the curse of Jeconiah. That becomes more clear as we go through the rest of this. Verse 17, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations from David until the captivity in Babylon. There are 14 generations from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. So what an amazing genealogy Jesus had. Now it's been said you can pick your friends, but you can never pick your relatives. But Jesus could from eternity past. He knew these were going to be his relatives. But again, what this shows me is that Jesus did not choose the best of the best, the cream of the crop, but he chose people from every background, every economic status, people from different cultures, people whose sins run the full gamut and spectrum of wickedness and depravity. I'm getting at a point here that this represents you and me. And Jesus did that to show us that nobody is outside of his realm of grace and mercy and love and forgiveness and salvation. Jesus came into this world to save sinners, to heal broken hearts, to set captives free, to restore messed up lives. And if you turn to Christ by faith and you receive him as your Lord and Savior, he will freely give you the free gift of eternal life. As I mention every Christmas, the best gift you could ever receive, if you haven't, is the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers to everyone because for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So God gave Jesus the free gift he offers to you, and all you can do is receive. If you don't open the gift, it will do you no good. But if you receive that gift, you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, the most amazing gift of all, eternal life with the Lord. So look at verse 18. We'll dig in a little deeper here than last night. He says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Uh, again, this verse literally speaks volumes here. In no uncertain terms, Mary is a virgin. In other words, she had never known a man physically, and yet she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit himself. It was a supernatural conception. We saw this last night. You go through um, uh, Luke chapter 1, and it's very clear how the Holy Spirit would overshadow her, and that phrase overshadow means to you know, come upon her... It's used of the, the temple and the tabernacle in the wilderness when it says the Shekinah glory of God overshadowed or came over the tabernacle by Moses and then Solomon's temple. It's the glory of the Lord. Just came over the Virgin Mary. So she would give birth to Jesus, but she did not give birth to God. Very important distinction. In other words, Jesus is was, always has been God. He did not become God at his birth. He took on human flesh at his birth, but he's always been God. So this is what we read in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh, that's what Christmas is all about, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Mary, she is the mother of Jesus in history, but she is not the mother of God in eternity. Yes, Mary is highly favored. She is blessed. But even the children last night mentioned the fact, they quoted from the fact that she was looking for God, her Savior, so she knew she was a sinner. She didn't stay perfect. That's what, you know, some churches believe. That's false teaching. We don't elevate her as co-redeemer with Jesus. That's, that's not true at all. She was highly favored. She was blessed. But she was a human being like all of us. So again, according to the angel Gabriel in Luke 1.35, the Holy Spirit would overshadow her would come over her, and, and just supernaturally she became pregnant with the baby Jesus. Notice also here in verse 18 that Mary and Joseph were betrothed. 
That's an important phrase, especially to the Jewish people in that day. Uh, it says Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together. And as you know, there are basically three parts to a Jewish wedding, three stages. The first stage is referred to as the engagement period, and that would start when children are little. They could be four or five years old. You, you know, this family had a little boy, this family had a little girl, and they would prearrange the marriage. Most of the Jews were prearranged marriages. And so these kids would grow up together, and the parents would be like, oh, yeah, my, you know, my son, he's going to be great. Uh, he's going to be wonderful for your daughter. And so they would learn and grow. And then a year before the actual wedding date, they would have what was called the engagement period or betrothal. That's what's referred here. About a year before the actual wedding, they were betrothed. It's like how we look at engagement. You know, they're legally binding in marriage at this point to the Jews. The only way you could get out of the betrothal was through a divorce. But here's the important thing. You could not consummate the marriage until the wedding day. That was very, very important. And so that's why it says here she was going to be with child while they are betrothed. In other words, they have not yet been officially married. They haven't consummated the marriage. And so now we have some issues here. In fact, if the woman was found to be pregnant before the actual ceremony, she would be stoned to death. You can read about it in Deuteronomy 22. The law requires her to be put to death. If they caught the man and the woman together, they would both be put to death. But if she was found pregnant and they didn't know who the father was, they would stone her. So it's during this betrothal period with Joseph, sometime before they consummate the marriage, she finds herself pregnant with baby Jesus. So this explains Joseph's reaction in verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. Again, I can only imagine what's racing through Joseph's mind at this moment when Mary tells him, I'm pregnant. Again, put yourself in his shoes. What's he going to think? What? You've been violated? We need to go to the authorities. We need to report this. we got to hold whoever did this to you responsible. No, nobody did this to me. You know, the Holy Spirit came over me, and that's how I'm pregnant. What? Are you crazy? You know, I would have believed if somebody violated you, but what? That doesn't make any sense. And so he's having a hard time with this. He's got to figure out a way to protect her. That's what it says here, that he was a just man. He was minded to put her away secretly because in his mind, he goes, she's going to be killed. I know I'm not the father. I know we, I, we didn't do anything. Nobody's going to believe this, that she is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And you read about it in other gospel accounts where they would accuse Jesus of being born of fornication. I mean, they brought that up, but they didn't believe the virgin birth, even though it's in their scriptures. So deep down, Joseph loves Mary. He cannot fathom the thought of her being put to death because literally they would take the woman, as now they find out she's pregnant, they would take her outside the city or outside the village, they would pick up large stones and they would just start throwing them at her until she died. That's what he's picturing in his mind. I cannot see this happening to you, Mary. This cannot happen. So he's trying to figure out, what am I going to do? Well, look at verse 20. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Again, he's just emotionally drained. He's tired. He finally falls asleep. And I'm sure he's just wrestling. What am I going to do with her? And then this angel appears in a dream and lets him know, don't be afraid. Take her as your wife. This is of the Holy Spirit. This is going to be difficult for you, Joseph. You know, your world's about to be turned upside down because of what's going on here. You are not the father, but Mary's right. 
She is conceived by the Holy Spirit, baby Jesus. Amazing. So not only was Mary chosen by God to bring forth Jesus into this world, but Joseph was chosen by God to help provide for him, to raise him up, to be a blessing to Jesus. Can you imagine being the stepdad of Jesus? I mean, just getting together with other dads, what a weird thing that would be. You know, your kids are like four or five years old, and they're hanging out playing, and you know, one of the dads says, oh, my son Levi, he is just such a good boy. Oh, yeah, Levi, yeah, my son Isaac, oh, he's so good. What's Joseph going to say? Yeah, geez, he's perfect, you know. Well, I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, that would be tough to put yourself as the one responsible for raising Jesus, the one who's going to save his people from their sins. So the angel continues to speak to Joseph here. Verse 21, she will bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Again, this is why he came. This is who he is. His name is Jesus. Again, the Hebrew word is Yeshua, which means God's salvation or Yahweh saves. That's his mission to save his people from their sins. Now, who are his people? Again, it's simply anybody will receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. This little baby that you're going to call Jesus, he will be the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. That's his mission, to save you, to save me from our sins. Again, our sins are what separates us from God. It's our sin nature that prevented us from going to heaven. It's our sin nature that keeps us from going into the presence of the Lord. So that had to be taken care of. That's why Jesus came, to save us from our sins. Our sins that have kept us in bondage to Satan's domain, that leads to death, that leads to destruction. But again, that's why he came. First of all, to die in our place for our sins. But he also had to rise up from the grave because only the risen, living Lord and Savior can offer us that free gift, which includes new life in Christ, a new home in heaven, a new family, which is made up of billions of brothers and sisters in the Lord. So if you don't get along with any of your siblings or relatives today, you've got billions that you'll get to know throughout heaven. They've been forgiven, just like you have, healed, changed, been given the new gift, the, the living hope of joy and peace forever and ever. And above all, we've been reconciled to our eternal, with an eternal relationship with God our Father in glory. It's going to be amazing. Now, one of the greatest ways that Gabriel will calm Joseph's fears here is by reminding him of God's word, God's prophecies. In other words, Joseph, he says, don't be afraid. After all, this was all proclaimed. This was all prophesied about. And he's going to quote from Isaiah 7, 14. That's what we see here in verse 22. By the way, when you go through the scriptures and you read prophecies, not just past prophecies that have been fulfilled, but now we're living in a time where, where we're seeing future prophecies being fulfilled, and we know these things are going to be fulfilled. If Jesus fulfilled 300 with his first coming, there's about 300 dealing with his second coming. He fulfilled the first 300 perfectly, literally. He's going to fulfill the last 300 perfectly, literally. So when we look at these prophecies, and we're going through the book of Revelation on Sunday mornings, we can experience God's peace in our hearts, in our minds, as we realize that God's prophecies concerning these last days are being fulfilled right before our very eyes. And this should give you great comfort. This should give you great encouragement, knowing that God is on the throne. He is in control. And, and that Jesus is coming back, and he will right every wrong when he does. So look at verse 22. Gabriel, if that's the angel that was appearing to him in this dream, we know it was Gabriel that appeared to Mary about all these things. So he says, All this will be, was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child 
and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Again, I can imagine Joseph, put yourself in his sandals, being like, wow, this is amazing. Mary is right. She's the virgin. This is the prophecy that's given. That baby, Jesus, Yeshua, God's salvation, he is Emmanuel, God with us. And I, I can imagine just the, the truth coming through his heart, coming into his mind. He must have been so excited, just like, wow, this is awesome. Jesus, as you know, we talked about this last night as well. It, you know, he had to be born in Bethlehem, so I have to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem because that was prophesied in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. This is what it says. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little from among uh, the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting, or from the days of eternity. That was the place. That was the prophecy given, again, 700 years before Jesus was born. The Messiah has to be born in Bethlehem. And so they travel. Well, she's eight and a half months pregnant, gets down to Bethlehem, and she gives birth right away when they get there. And they wrap him up in swaddling clothes, and you know the rest of the story. That's the perspective we need to realize. This all came about because God declared this is how it's going to take place. Paul understood this. Look at this verse in Galatians 4, starting in verse 4. It says, But when the fullness of the time had come, that means at the exact right moment, from God's perspective, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So God's timing is perfect. Jesus came right on time according to God's perfect plan. Under the law, he was born. And then we read this in Romans 8, starting in verse 3. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh... In other words, nobody could fulfill the law but Jesus. He's perfect. We would fail. If you've tried to keep the law, you know, oh, I blew that one. Yeah, I tried to keep these ten, but yeah, nine of them I've already messed up. So realize that. The law, it can't save you. The law is perfect, and we are not. It was weak through our flesh to keep it. Notice, God did... God fulfilled it by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. This is why Jesus came, to die on the cross so sin could be dealt with. That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In other words, we are no longer trying to make ourselves righteous by trying to keep the perfect law of God, but by simply placing our faith in Jesus, who alone fulfilled all the requirements of God's law, we are now declared righteous. We now belong to Him. He has placed us into the perfect body of Christ because we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This is why it is so important to understand why Jesus came. Not just to be born in a manger, and we look at that, oh, he's cute and cuddly. That's not the end of the story. That was just the beginning of his earthly ministry. And what he did the next 33 years is why we are here today, born again, saved, going to heaven, if you know him as your Lord and Savior. So God with us. Then look at verse 24. We're almost done. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep. Oh, just Again, just picturing him exhausted physically, emotionally. He sleeps and the angel you know, appears to him in his dreams, tells him these things. Being aroused from sleep. In other words, he's just like, whoa, startled awake. He's not tired now did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife, 
and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. I can just picture Joseph, when it says being aroused from sleep, him jumping out of his bed, <laughs> running frantically all over Nazareth, looking for Mary, and finding Mary, and just like, oh, Mary, how could I ever doubt you? You're right. I was wrong to think these things about you. We're getting married, and we're, you're going to have a baby. We're going to call him Jesus. And she's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, the angel already told me these things. We're going to call him Jesus. He's the Savior of the world. And he's like, woohoo! That should be our response to the Lord Jesus Christ. Woohoo! He loves us. He died for us. He's coming back for his bride. We're going to see him in glory. Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm.